entrepreneur and a freelance developer, consultant, data scientist, working mostly with Python, C++, and JavaScript in the Jupyter and ecosystem. Creator of Ippy Volume Vix, founder of Vix.io. His expertise ranges from fast numerical prediction, computation, API design to 3D visualizations. He's got a bachelor's in ITC, a master's and a PhD in astronomy. Likes to code and solve problems. Jovan is a senior data scientist that Tickets where he creates predictive models and recommender systems around the e-commerce domain. Working mostly in Python in the Jupyter Pi data ecosystem. He has considerable experience in creating dashboards, clustering analysis, and predictive modeling. Oh, predictive modeling. Joven has a PhD in astrophysics and is the co-founder of VEGS and is now interested in novel machine learning technologies and applications. It's great to have you all here. I'm so damn excited to learn about what's going on in the Vegas ecosystem and how it can help me as an engineer. Awesome. <laughs> I told you not to get your hopes up. I told you keep the bar low and we'll be good. And I had to manage- Best performance ever. <laughs> had to manage your expectations. So you weren't uh, coming at me with high hopes, we could say, but uh, that's that's it. Now everybody knows who you are. I'm going to leave it to you all. I'm going to jump off the screen. And I don't know who wants to, if one of you wants to share your screen first, or maybe we can give, Ben, do you want to give the background on yeah. how this came to be? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Demetrius. Yeah, so to <laughs> recap what Demetrius just beautifully sang, uh, for all of us, uh, we're with Martin and Jovan, who are the creators of an open source project called Vakes. Uh, for people who don't know what Vakes is, Vakes is an out-of-core data frame library that enables users to process enormous amounts of data locally on their laptops without needing clusters um, or any kind of intense configuration. Uh, the history, the reason why we're doing this stream and why I'm particularly excited about it is because the company I work at, Galileo, we use Vakes. Um, and after a really long amount of investigation um, and testing of a lot of different libraries, we came to find VIX as an incredible platform, an incredible tool for what we were looking for. Um, so I had joined the VIX community a while back, um, have spoken with Martin and Jovan and bothered them endlessly over the last <laughs> six months. Um, and when I got involved with MLOps, I thought they would be a perfect tool um, to kind of add to a lot of data scientists toolbox, things that they can do locally that they maybe didn't realize they could do. Um, so we're really grateful to have you guys on. Um, and I'll kick it off to either of you, whoever wants to kind of start going in depth. Yeah, let me let me start. Thanks, uh, Ben, for the uh, and Demetrius for the intro. So yeah, but uh, it's going to be a, a bit of a like an intro from me, uh, like a bit of a, a talk style. But feel free to like ask questions, Ben. Um, 
and then Jovan will uh, will take over. So um, uh, we're going to show a, a new approach to data frames and, and pipelines. Um, so agenda, because we're Dutch, we like that. So I'll uh, I'll say a bit about the, like the theory behind facts, how it works, and what it is. Then Jovan will do some demo in a notebook. Um, basically three parts, as you can see here. And I'll uh, I'll uh, end off, and uh, we can have some more discussions and questions after. So uh, let me start by this this uh, this famous or infamous uh, um, graph of of the uh, kind of the ecosystem of the PyFish landscape in Python. And and as you can see, there are like um, I won't go into the details, but there are like lots of libraries for Python uh, for visualization and. And some people think this is like a bad thing, like it's kind of a, like a chaos, uh, like there's no like single library, like in R you have like ggplot and people are happy with this. And they say, well, why, why don't we have that in Python? I think it's actually good because there's like, it shows that there are many creative people building libraries, they have new ideas, et cetera, innovating. Um, so I think it shows that, that, that there's a lot of innovation in uh, Python. Uh, but you have to find a library that actually really fits your, your needs. And the same, although not as bad, is uh, with uh, um, data frames. So of course, the uh, kind of the, uh, uh, the start of uh, data frames in Python is uh, the Pandas library that uh, everybody should know. Um, and based on this, there are some, uh, say, spring offs like DAS data frame builds on top of uh, Pandas uh, and distributes it uh, using uh, the DAS ecosystem. Uh, Modin has a bit of a similar approach, but can work on uh, Dask or Array. Um, and then you have a set of libraries that um, uh, at least try to mimic the um, uh, Pandas uh, API, at least partially, um, but are not built on top of. Koalas recently merged into uh, PySpark. Uh, Rapid that works on the GPU. Um, and today we'll talk about uh, effects. And there are many more, like um, I've showed the uh, Turi, and there are, there are, of course, there are others. Um, but uh, of course, these slides are never complete. So what is FEX in a nutshell? So uh, high performance out of core data frame library. So it's fast and out of core algorithms ensure that you can work with data that's larger than RAM. Like could be a terabyte uh, data set and you only have like 128 gigs of RAM. That's no problem. Um, to get an idea about the performance, so we often say like you can uh, at least work with a billion uh, rows or samples on a single machine or a, a laptop, just to get an idea of what you can do. Uh, it is like Pandas, similar API, but not built on top of Pandas. And um, what's uh, quite important, actually, easy installation. Just pip install fetch and it's running. No cluster to set up, no administration, just this is it. Um, it's free, it's open source, MIT licensed, and it has uh, more than 7,000 stars on, uh, on GitHub. Um, so to understand like why FEX actually does or can do what it uh, does, uh, like on, uh, the performance, etc., it's I think it's useful to, uh, to explain a few concepts. So I'm gonna talk about memory mapping, column-based storage, why we don't do memory copies, or how we don't do memory copies, and something about the compute and expression system. Um, so I think first let, let's go over like why we're using memory mapping. So let's let's start with what happens when you do like a normal uh, disk read. So this is a graphical representation of the uh, the memory you have, and uh, you want to read something from disk into memory uh, because then you can operate on it. So you allocate a piece of memory. And then you read from disk into memory, but actually it goes into the operating system cache. So the kernel will copy it to operating system cache and then will copy it to your uh, allocated piece of memory. Um, and then it goes to the CPU where you maybe do some aggregation, like you uh, count how many uh, values have or uh, sum up all the values. Um, but actually, uh, you erase the memory because this, um, can you see my mouse cursor? Yeah, a little bit. Like this piece of memory uh, is allocated and that cannot be like reused and you're doing this memory copy, which is not really necessary. Um, so instead, if you do memory mapping, uh, basically you get a pointer to this cache of the operating system. So you don't have to do a memory copy. 
And uh, instead of allocating this piece of memory, you're now getting a, a piece of memory you can read from, but also a piece of memory that the uh, operating system can, uh, uh, can basically uh, free. And so it can, uh, can be useful if um, some other process needs some uh, memory, it will basically throw away the cache. And the next time that you read it, the operating system will read it again. So it's uh, we're basically outsourcing all the memory management to the uh, to the kernel, uh, where many smart people uh, thought of the be best ways on uh, on doing this. Um, some other advantages is um, that uh, basically you have shared memory for free. So everybody, every process, uh, for instance, if you're using Flask, Unicorn, Fast API, Dash, or have multiple. Uh, uh, um, kernels, IPython kernels, if you're using Jupyter, um, then they will all share the same memory. So if you have a one terabyte uh, file on this, uh, if you read a particular column or use a particular column, it's in the cache and all the other processes share that. So you don't run out of memory quite uh, that fast with uh, things. Uh, that's one disadvantage is that you need to store the data on this the same as it would go in memory because it's basically making a direct copy from this to the memory and then to the CPU. So it has to be in a format that the CPU uh, understands. So why column-based? So we focus mostly on analytical workloads. So imagine you have like a hundred columns and you're only using like two, three, maybe 10 columns. Uh, then you want, and, and because basically um, um, like this devices, etc., everything works with like a block sizes, um, and sequential access is really optimal for CPU and disk. It's better to, to have like column storage. You basically read only the data that you need and not the other columns. So how do you store this in, uh, on disk then? What are the options uh, for column-based uh, storage? Um, well, when we started, we started using HDR5 because there wasn't really a, uh, a format that was uh, suitable for this. In HDF5, you can think of it like a, uh, a binary version of XML or JSON. So it, it's not really standard. Like you need to have some kind of schema or explain people like where the data is. Um, so it's not really a standard way of uh, saving the data, but it's quite flexible. And HDF5 is an old standard, uh, like 100 years from now, you'll be able to, uh, to, uh, to read it. Um, so the data is also stored as a single uh, contiguous array. So if you have some uh, numerical data stored in it, uh, we can actually give you access to the NumPy array that's uh, memory mapped uh, to, to disk. It's a simple like one dimensional uh, array and native storage so we can uh, memory map that. Um, so meanwhile, uh, Apache Arrow uh, was developed, um, which can also store it, uh, uh, store tabular data onto disk. Um, and it is a standard. So it is specialized for tabular data. So that basically means if I store using FAX my data uh, using Apache Arrow and I give it to an other pro uh, um, say process that is also uh, using Apache Arrow to read that, uh, they will fully understand each other. So that's uh, really good for interoperability. Um, and Arrow has support for chunking and also native storage. And of course, Apache uh, uh, Parquet, industry standard. Uh, the only downside, which is also an upside, it's compressed, so it's good for, an, um, for a slow I.O., uh, for instance, over the network, but it's compressed, so it requires uh, deserialization. So that gives a bit of a performance uh, penalty. Um, so as I said, we, we don't make memory copies. So how do we how, how do we deal with that? Like imagine you have a one terabyte file on disk and you open it, it's memory mapped um, and, uh, and you want to filter it. So let, let me explain you by this conceptual model of a data frame. So we have, I have a data frame with some data here, two columns, X and Y with uh, a few values and we want to filter this. So this DF2 is basically all the rows for which y is smaller than 10. So instead of making a copy of these, uh, um, these arrays, we basically reference the same data. So we never change the data. We consider that immutable, the data is the data and that stays on disk and we don't touch that. Um, but we keep, keep track of the filters that you're doing. So in this case, y smaller than 10. 
Um, so this filtering step is, is quite a, uh, a cheap operation. And similar, if you add a column here, we add a new column Z, uh, which is X plus Y times 10. So instead of, of uh, eagerly computing this and um, say, imagine you have uh, 1 billion rows, uh, it would cost something like eight uh, gigs of RAM. Instead, we keep a, uh, uh, a basically a dictionary with the virtual columns and uh, what the expressions are. So we can compute that uh, on the fly. So, um, so how do we compute things then? I mean, there are, we do all of this lazily, uh, but we basically have streaming algorithms. You can think of it as uh, MapReduce, and they basically work in chunks. And every ch uh, and when you need this particular chunk, we compute what is necessary. So everything's been done in chunks. Um, something that that is also important is uh, because we're in Python, we have the uh, infamous uh, GIL, the Global Interpreter Lock that um, avoids efficient uh, uh, multi-threading in, in pure Python programs, but we do a lot of the processing in C++ um, where we can actually um, uh, make use of all the, uh, the CPUs. And, and um, I've already showed a bit of this. Uh, the, the, basically, if you add a new column, we're making use of this expression system that Vex has, and it stores the expression, not the result. Um, and we evaluate it when needed. So if you compute something, we calculate, we take a chunk and we calculate just the, um, the data for that chunk. And it's also useful because, uh, and Jovan will show that in his demo, that you can do a just-in-time compilation using Numba, Python, or even um, execute it on the uh, uh, GPU using uh, CUDA. Just to make this concrete, for instance, if you use NumPy, um, you have an X column, Y column, you multiply it, you just get the result. In fact, if you have a data frame with an X column, a Y column, and you multiply it, um, it basically keeps track of what the expression is, X times Y. And if you print it out, yes, it will compute the first five and the last five values, but it won't do it for, uh, uh, for, uh, for all of the data. So um, yeah, Jovan, it's uh, it's your time. This is my lucky slide. So uh, also Jovan's lucky slide, I I, I hope. So um, uh, let me uh, pass it on to uh, Jovan for a uh, demo. Unless you have some questions, man. Yeah, I was going to ask, um, and feel free to ask any questions, people, uh, anybody who's watching uh, on the chat, and we can answer those as well. I was curious what the motivation for this was, um, like why you started right in the beginning. Yeah, um, yeah, I, I skipped that part. So uh, we we were both in astronomy, and um, uh, we needed to uh, to work with a, um, a large data set, uh, the Gaia data set. It wasn't out out yet, but we were. Uh, it was I think two years before we would get a data set that was like uh, predicted to be one billion rows, hundred columns, one terabyte, and we had no tools to work with it except for. Uh, uh, they basically said, well, we would, uh, you should use, um, uh, what is it again, uh, Jovan? I think uh, not, not. A version of SQL that's called ADQL, which is a small subset of SQL. Yeah, that as well. And uh, I think something um, uh, Hadoop even. Yeah, I think, and, and like people in astronomy don't do any like Java programming. So that, that's basically not an option. Uh, and then we did some back on the envelope, envelope calculation, like, okay, like, like how large is it? Uh, like, okay, let's say we want to make a, uh, uh, a simple plot of, uh, just the, uh, sky coordinates on the sky. Um, and if you, if you take a look at how much data that is, something like 16 gigs of RAM and you do some computations, like, uh, you can actually do some, uh, uh 2d histograms in like one second in theory. So we tried. And um, yeah, that that was possible. So in the beginning, it was really focused on this special topic of in astronomy, like visualizing uh, basically maps on the sky, and um, uh, and and yeah, that there was no tool that uh, uh, that could do this on on a simple uh, simple hardware, and uh, and then I think Jovan can continue telling the story what happened after that. Awesome. Yeah, thanks, Martin. Oh, Ben, I think I'm sharing my screen, but uh, maybe it's not visible yet. Maybe you can... Uh... Uh, uh, yeah, Demetrius, thank you. Right. Um, 
Is this large enough? Should I zoom in more? I think one more zoom in would probably be great. Okay, let me yeah, try to make it a bit wider. That's great. Yeah, so in the original uh, version of X, like the very, very first version, it was like a GUI tool, I think built on ah, yeah. what, what's Martin? Uh, yeah, it was written in uh, a QT. So it was a, a graphical uh, graphical program. Yeah, desktop application. And we were, and we were both researchers. And uh, periodically, I would come to Martin's office and I would be like, hey, man, I really need the custom labels, and I really need this, and I really need that. And Martin got so upset, and uh, he turned it into a Python library that I can install and be like, OK, now <laughs> you can do it yourself. And uh, then as we both learned that there are like big data problems or large data problems outside, outside our little bubble, we said, OK, we should probably trans, uh, translate this into a proper data flame library, library so like, everybody can use it regardless of domain, kind of standard way. And Panda seemed to be the adopted standard, so we slowly moved to that uh, more and more. So that's more or less how it, how it came to be. That's awesome. Cool. So let's get uh, a bit on the practical side. So thanks, Martin. That was a great intro on like how Dex uh, works in the background, and now we get to see it in action. Um, so this is going to be a bit of a heavy demo. I hope I hope you enjoy it and, and bear with me. So we're going to use this Eurotaxi dataset, like a big chunk of it, uh, like a couple of year, bunch of years. Uh, you'll you'll see it in a in a minute. It's all publicly available data. You can get it from this link. And yeah, just before I start, like this bunch of notebooks that I will show will be put on GitHub, so you can download them, uh, play around. Uh, we're also happy to share the data, so you can uh, well, you can explore as, as you wish. So let's import uh, VEX and a couple of standard libraries. These are the main concepts uh, that Martin went over uh, that we're going to see them in action in a, in a second. So before we open the file, I just want to show that we have a bunch of versions of this data set uh, that we have on disk uh, on our local machines. And you can see they're quite big. This is the size. And uh, well, this is the file, the file name. And let's, uh, we're going to work with this one. So it's 100 uh, gigabytes on disk, and I definitely don't have that much RAM. So I'll open it with a simple open command, and it's uh, quite fast. And actually, I can open it many times, and I can preview it, and uh, I can see that this file contains a bit over a billion rows. And the reason why it's so fast, and I can uh, display this again and again and again, and it's because we're using memory mapping, actually, we're not we don't need to show and go over the entire data all at once. And we see we have a bunch of columns. But because this is a preview and we're doing this in Jupyter, uh, we only need to show the first five and the last five, kind of like head and tail situation. And that's quite fast, right? Yeah, you can show 10 rows uh, easily. So we can, VEX has the kind of normal Pandas data, data frame uh, API. So we have the common methods, like you can explore uh, Date types in a very standard way, um, and uh, we do shallow hopis. I think Martin explained the theory behind this, but let's say I only want to work with a subset of this data frame, and I want to really focus on some of the columns. In a typical pandas-like uh, data frame, if I make a copy, then I would need almost as much RAM as I as I as I uh, need to basically load this first data frame. But here, because I'm just referencing the original data, I can do this a couple of times. Nothing happens. I'm just uh, basically referencing um, the same data and just work with that subset of columns or that subset of rows. So interaction on a particular column, it's pretty much the same. If you want to preview, let's say, a trip distance, Again, it's super fast. It doesn't matter if this is a if, if this is a billion or hundred billion. We're just uh, getting a preview first uh, five and last five rows. That's super fast. Let's do another one. Date time of the pickup of, of the pickup uh, events. Again, pretty much the same story. So the fun part, part st starts when we actually want to ex uh, we want to do uh, stuff, uh, some calculations, some evaluations. So let's do some uh, some computation. Let's say we have a column that's called fair amount amount uh, that people pay for the trip and how far they traveled. And if we execute this, even though we're doing it for a billion rows, we get the results immediately. And again, this is quote unquote a trick, 
this is on just a preview. We don't eagerly execute uh, this computation across the, the entire data frame, but just uh, we show the first five and the last five rows of the result. And again, this is super trivial, super fast to calculate on virtually any machines. And this is what we call an expression. I think Martin highlighted uh, already in the slides. And this is kind of the foundation of the entire uh, how VEX uh, works in the background. And uh, I like this because uh, basically we'll get expressions everywhere. And uh, maybe I get a bit boring saying this uh, over and over again, but really keep in mind that everything that we'll do in the background, VEX will just store an expression of a mathematical or some, some operation. So we can take this expression that we just calculated and assign it to a data frame. And uh, we can, if we scroll all the way to the right, we'll see it over there. Again, this is not in memory. This uh, will be computed on demand. And then the same um, works uh, for virtually, like if you want to un want to add any any kind of uh, new call. So, what happens if you want to actually execute something? So. When we view this, we only see a part, part of it, just like the first five rows, we do a head five. But if we want to calculate, let's say the mean of this expression, let's start the, the operation, then we really go through the whole data frame. And uh, let's see how long that takes. I think uh, the very first operation uh, kind of needs to warm up uh, the CPU a bit. And maybe this is a live demo, so the computer is a bit nervous. And uh, of course, what happens in real life, uh, we do need to cache a bit of, of the data in memory first, so the index can basically scan, scan over it, uh, it fully. And uh, yeah, a nice feature of X that I really enjoy is this progress bar that most of the methods uh, methods have. So you can uh, immediately see uh, how how long uh, some, some operations are, are, are going to take. So this takes uh, 42 seconds the first try. We can try it again. It should be considerably faster. But now the, the, the CPU knows which, uh, basically which file, which part of the, of, of the physical memory we're going to work with. And now it's, uh, we get this, uh, this uh, one second performance. And yeah, we, we see uh, that there is a NAN, so something went wrong in the, in the, in the computation. And we, see, we kind of know that uh, we divide fair by distance. So if distance by any chance is zero, then this will, this will uh, cause a, not a number result. So let's do a simple filter, kind of like in Pandas, or just uh, think of all the, take all only distances that are above uh, zero, and we get a, a nice result. Interesting, uh, like a very useful uh, feature of X is that you can calculate a mean of a particular column, but we have this concept of selections, which are kind of filters or conditions, and you can specify multiple of them. So let's say we want to know what is the mean under this condition, but we also want to know what is the mean under this condition. And we can specify a single or a list of selections, what we call selections, and we get the result with one pass over the data. So we only scan the data once, and we compute uh, the result for both of, this, uh, both of these conditions, which can be quite useful when building dashboards or you just want to optimize your, your, your workflow. So you might be thinking, yeah, this is quite fast and elegant, but what happens if the operation is very computationally expensive? So let's, uh, let's see what happens for such a very computationally expensive operation. So here I've defined, like uh, this is a distance between uh, two points on a, on, on a surface of a sphere. And this expression, like it's quite mathematical. Um, there's many trigonometric operations, you know, see cosine, sine. It's, it's, a, it's, a long, it's a long, complicated expression. So let's see what happens if we, well, cr first uh, create a, a column in our data frame, which basically the, the the true distance between a pickup and drop of location of this taxi data set and sum everything. And by default, we're using NumPy, NumPy to do this calculation. And yeah, even though this is a quite expensive expression computationally, it's, uh, it's not so bad. I think uh, for a single machine, 1.1 billion, billion points, it takes about 12 seconds to, to, to execute this. But we can even do better almost for free. So if you have NumPy installed or Python, we can do uh, 
just in time compilation. So I think uh, Numba uses LLVM uh, in the background. And uh, when we did compile this expression, it's already much faster, two seconds for, for this complete expression. And if you have a GPU, I think this, this is the Linux machine that I'm on right now. Um, and uh, we have a GPU here. And we also support, uh, well, like executing expressions on, on the GPU. And the cool part is, since recently, if you have a more recent Mac with either M1 architecture or, or IMD GPU card, and your Mac supports Metal 2, um, well, you can do JIT Metal and use your Mac GPU for, for accelerating computations. So what we were saying earlier, where VEX really shines is computing statistics. And uh, let's, uh, like the, the simplest statistics is, let's say, uh, what we call zero dimensional. It's like a single number. Like counts, we can count how many valid values are in our data frame. But we can also count along that axis. So we can count how many values are in along this dimension within certain limit. This is essentially basically building up a histogram. We're counting how many events happen in a particular bin that we can visualize with your favorite visualization library and it's basically a, a histogram. And, but we can also generalize this. We can count along multiple dimensions. So in this case, we do a two-dimensional accounting operation. And if we visualize this, Again, I'm using Matplotlib here. Basically, we're getting a two-dimensional histogram. And we see all these operations are taking um, like a second or even less. And of course, this is just to demonstrate kind of the, the building blocks. But we have, as you will see, uh, convenience methods that, well, you can do this right away. You get nice labels, the right, uh, the right data ranges, and so on. So armed with these tools, let's, uh, let's take like a few minutes to, to do a proper, well, proper to do an example of, um, let's say, data science, uh, explorative data analysis. So we have this taxi data set. Let me show it here. And we have the pickup and drop off uh, times of the events. We have columns like number of passengers, how, how people paid, how far they went, where they were picked up, and then how much they paid, and, and some, other, uh, some other columns. So let's do some exploration. Let's see how frequently we get uh, Let's say how, how often we get uh, rides with a particular passenger account. And this is probably my, my most favorite method of any data frame, this value counts method. I use it all the time. And we see that for a, for a billion rows and uh, in with VEX, we, can, uh, we, we get the result basically in a second. And uh, yeah, we see that the, <laughs> there are many probably erroneous numbers. I don't think there are 200 passengers in a car on a typical yellow taxi car. So this gives some opportunity to clean, clean quickly through the data set. So let's, uh, let's say, OK, we only care about uh, rides between uh, one and including one and, and six passengers. So let's, uh, let's add this filter. And next, let's, uh, let's look up at the distribution of, uh, of, the, of uh, distances. Again, value counts. This is a bit, uh, well, you see the performance is more or less a second, but now we're, we're basically having a continuous variable. So you see we have many, many uh, different values. We can counter it really quickly. Uh, if we do a histogram of this, however, we get an interesting plot. <laughs> we see that, first of all, there are huge negative values. Something went wrong there. And also huge positive values, also something wrong there. But those are spike at zero. So as data scientists, we're like, wow, people, people went zero distance with, uh, with, with their taxi rides. So we can uh, investigate this a bit further. I'm not forgetting that I'm doing all this in real time. Nothing is pre-computed. And I'm working with a 1.1 billion row data frame. So we see, OK, if we look at the maximum distance, this is, uh, <laughs> this is a big distance that we really definitely need to, need to filter out. Uh, it's, yeah, it's basically virtually astronomical. So let's, uh, let's zoom in a little bit on our histogram, find something uh, that's a bit more um, reasonable. So let's say we care about distance in, but distances between 0 and 10 miles. That's, uh, that seems reasonable. So let's an add another filter. Um, so if there are outliers in these two basic columns, there are probably huge outliers in this uh, pickup and drop-off locations. And they're basically defining where New York City is. So in VEX, we have this feature where if you are working with two-dimensional plots, 
or heat maps, you can interactively, regardless of how big your data is, uh, look at uh, basically look at look at your look at your heat map. And this is New York City as traced uh, as traced by the pickup locations. You may not see it because it's dominated by outliers. But if I zoom in a bit through this to this uh, well, where the maze, most of the signal is, the the plot is redone. Uh, you can see the a nice looking, a bit circular progress bar here, how far the calculation, how fast the calculation goes. I can zoom in a bit more and the New York City should be resolved. Here it is. And uh, well, now we can, you can uh, take a look at your favorite part of New York City. I've never been, but I've kind of seen enough movies that I know that this is Manhattan. This is one of the airports and so on. And at least for this project, this allows us to interactively kind of select our boundaries of New York City. But you can imagine, depending of, on your use case, if you're building dashboards or really need to filter out things quickly, even for a billion rows on a single machine, you get basically an interactive, uh, interactive performance. Hey. So with this, yeah, yeah. Johan, yeah, a quick question jumped in. Um, not entirely related to this heat map, which is pretty awesome, but related to the memory mapping um, and file handling. If you have, for example, many Parquet files stored all across your computer, um, is there a way that VASE can kind of handle that and treat it as a single file, um, as a single data frame for your operations? Yeah, actually, if you have, regardless whether they're Parquet or Arrow or HDF5, if as long as they obey, obey more or less the same schema or can be course to obey the same schema if you just uh, open them uh, with like a globe expression uh, using the open command vex will assume it's a single file and it will smartly uh, oh, smartly treat it as a single data frame without uh, without uh, any input from the user there is some very small overhead there so if you're really looking for optimal performance we recommend to to do that and then export it as a single file. But if you're in your exploration phase, then it's uh, perfectly fine to, 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 to continue uh, with that. So for example, bakes that open path slash star dot parquet. They'll just open yeah. all the parquet files. Very yeah, cool. yeah, yeah, awesome. yeah. Yeah, so let's, uh, let's continue. Let's add more neural filters with this. Uh, let's say we agreed on what we want our focus of this task to be. So let's add more filters on the uh, pickup and drop of locations. And then uh, this is pretty standard. Um, I've zoomed in, so maybe you can see everything, but let's add a couple of more features. Let's look at the trip duration. This is just the difference between uh, pickup and drop off or drop off and pickup. And let's look at the trip speed, which is the distance divided by, by time basically. And uh, again, we can look at some histograms and there is a reason why I'm showing <laughs> It seems like the same exercise and again and again. So now, yeah, I'm computing the entire like filter of that we assigned before. Again, we see a bunch of outliers. Um, we want to zoom in to what seems more reasonable, as maybe we're a bit of the main experts and agree what what we what our accepted uh, trip duration should be. And we can repeat this uh, idea for trip uh, speed. We want to visualize the trip speed. So before each histogram is computed, we recompute the filter and that may take a couple of seconds. And this is the distribution of, uh, of trip speeds. Again, seems uh, <laughs> quite high to be driving 125 miles per hour in New York City. So let's limit it to 60. And uh, yeah, finally, let's, uh, let's look at the fair amount. And the point why I'm showing you this is so you can get an idea of the performance as I'm adding more and more filters. So by now I've added over 10 bordering on maybe closer to 20 filters. And you see that I can more or less interactively produce all these plots with, uh, well, these selections maybe, maybe uh, may look simple, but internally VEX does uh, quite some optimizations to give you a, a good performance. And let's do another one. And, um, and let's add another filter. So we see that this is basically interactive regardless of, uh, well, we have the capacity to add many more filters and still, uh, 
still, still keep uh, interactive workflow. All right, uh, let's add some daytime features. Basically now let's move into some more of a exploration phase instead of just filtering. Let's add pickup day and day of week and, uh, and typical typical daytime features like this. We, we support uh, pretty much the same API as Pandas here. And uh, interesting feature of X here is that we want to basically build a heat map, but we want a specific, specific columns to be treated as categorical. So instead of doing the bidding based on values, we want to kind of do like a group by trick and say, okay, use each value of pickup hour, which is between zero and 23 as a distinct value and then bin according to that. And uh, if we, well, let VAX know that we want to treat certain values as categories, basically, that allows us to build us this map, which is a heat map showing uh, the, the redder the number, the, the redder the square, the more trips happened uh, in that day and that time. And this map makes sense if you look at it. So in the early hours of the day, relatively few trips and then Friday night, Saturday night uh, around midnight, there are lots of taxi trips and there is a small peak uh, when people go to work at around eight and nine in the morning. So yeah, it's, it's easy to make this exploration uh, loads uh, with DEX. Also, we support uh, fast group by, again, I'm doing all this on a billion points. And here I wanna show like a nice feature, one of my favorite features. So here I'm doing a group by on pickup hour and I want to do two operations. One is I just wanna know the mean tip amount, but I'm curious whether, whether people tip more if uh, there are two people in the car, like two passengers. And think about it, how would you do this in Pandas or in SQL? So you'll do one group by and then another group by, then you have to join them because you have a different condition. With VEX, you can specify an aggregator and specify what you want to aggregate. And again, have this selection or condition uh, a parameter that basically says, okay, now aggregate, but keep this in mind. So in a very simple way, you can, we can, uh, you, we can uh, basically add quite complex aggregations in just, well, one operation. So I don't know if, uh, if there is any much of a difference. I mean, you can plot this uh, now that the data is quite small with your favorite this library and maybe do some, some more exploration from here if you're really interested in this, uh, in this question. Joins, uh, so let's, uh, let's look at, uh, look at the join. So let's look at uh, joining this uh, data frame that we just created, the result of the group by operation to the main 1 billion uh, row data frame. I think this is one of the few methods where we don't have a progress bar, but uh, the operation is reason reasonably fast. So yeah, less than 10 seconds. And if we scroll all the way to the right, we see the two new columns uh, that, we, that we added. So uh, after doing some operation, some of these explorations, visualizations, what do we, what kind of advice do we want to give taxi drivers? So one of the things that taxi drivers really want to know is like, where should they camp out? Where should they like, pick up passengers to maximize their earnings? So naively, let's just look at where people most frequently start from. So this is a map that we kind of already saw, just a heat map of pickup locations. But you know, this may not, you may not. Uh, tell the whole story. We may wanna make a similar heat map, but in just instead uh, of just counting like frequency or values, we wanna see where, like what do we wanna show basically? We wanna show where the mean fair amount or uh, the, the amount of money people paid is the highest. And it gives like slightly different picture, but maybe you can think, okay, this is, this is nice. Uh, it may kind of makes sense. The airports are outlined in this, they main like uh, fairways, but it also doesn't, doesn't show the whole picture. Maybe we can do a bit better. So we wanna basically expose this column that we started with, uh, like fair divided by distance, because this accounts for expenses. Let's say you take a passenger somewhere far away, but then <laughs> you have to return, and you have to pay for petrol and so on. And then, uh, well, passengers, uh, sorry, taxi, taxi drivers really wanna know about this. And yeah, so you get a, a different, a different uh, map. The, the idea is that the whole, the whole time we're using 1.1 uh, billion data frame that we filtered, we've done some operations and it takes a couple of seconds to visualize this uh, on a single computer. So that's uh, the first part. 
uh, this kind of the basics of X and how it works and how it feels. And again, not, none of this is pre-computed. Uh, I'm doing this in real time. So if, if there are glitches, like it's, it's part of the experience. And then now the second part that I re I'm really excited to show is we've used uh, how VEX is constructed, the memory mapping, the expression system for an interesting concept of, of doing machine learning. And uh, I'm really, really happy to show you, show you this. So we've also published an article. It's a medium, funny picture. You can take a look if you, if you want a more verbose explanation. We're going to go a bit quickly over this part. So let, again, uh, let's uh, import VEX. Where I'm going to import the same big data file, 100 gigabytes uh, from this. And uh, this, is, this file is sorted by, by pickup date. And uh, just to make a train test split, I know the magic number. So I'm just going to take everything that is in the final year of the data set 2015. We're going to leave it uh, outside uh, and count it as a test set. Otherwise, uh, everything else will go in the, in the train. And we have plenty of data. <laughs> To do this, so billion rows in the train set and uh, and a hundred thousand in the test set. The idea is uh, we want to predict how long a taxi trip will take, and this is well, if you're if you're running a taxi company, you might find it quite useful. So let's define the target variable, a virtual expression. Oh, I think this is uh, I don't want to cheat, so let's uh, restart the kernel. So you don't you guys don't see uh, spoilers. Let's uh, restart the process. Train test split. Let's define a target variable. Let's do some feature engineering. So we can go quite quickly over this part that we basically explored in the previous uh, section. Trip speed. We create some daytime features from the from the pickup uh, from the pickup uh, daytime. The distance between uh, pickup and drop off on the surface of a sphere. And another interesting feature, which is like a direction angle. So whether the trip went like due north or due east and so on, might be quite useful. We want to clean the data. We basically did this in the previous section. So I've just summarized all the filters here. I'm going to execute them uh, just now. And this leads us to a quick intro about VEXML. So VEXML is a package on VEX that basically uses VEX and the VEX philosophy to allow us to do well, machine learning and machine learning related tasks on big data. So what it does, it, uh, it implements various uh, categorical encoders, scalars, transformers that uh, basically use the X under the hood, which meaning, meaning that you can uh, well, work uh, on arbitrary amounts of data and it's all parallelized and optimized under the hood. And uh, because everything what, that we do is uh, using expressions, this, uh, well, as you'll see, allows us to well, have some interesting ideas about deployment and uh, well, deploying, uh, deploying the whole pipeline uh, as one, as, as you will see. So let's employ, uh, uh, let's import XML. Let's do a couple of transformations. So an interesting thing to do is to do a PCA of the pickup and uh, drop off uh, locations. And what's the, the motivation of this? Well, the motivation is twofold. First, I just wanna show the performance uh, of X when I'm doing uh, calculations like this, you see it takes only about 12 seconds. Uh, interesting thing when you do uh, something that uh, I really like when you do this kind of transformations with X is that, well, we have a scikit-learn kind of API with small differences. So you have the method and in the method, you decide which features you're going to use and all the rest of the parameters. When you transform a data frame, the output of this method is immediately stored in the same data frame. And these are all ex basically expressions, so they don't take any extra memory, but my result is already readily visible. So then if you want to do diagnostics, and I mean diagnostics in terms of does this feature make sense and make plots uh, relating to other features and so on, it's super easy because you know everything about your, everything about your process and everything is so contained in, into a single data frame. Now we can visualize this, and you can see my motivation why why this is uh, why I want to do this. So this is an interesting case. You can see the motivation, the, the performance when I'm trying to do a two heat maps where one is fully uh, composed of virtual columns. And yeah, U.S. cities uh, you probably know this are kind of built on a sort of a grid. So when you do a PCA, you get this funny alignment. Uh, you can kind of create a chessboard, uh, which 
depending on the machine learning algorithm that you use, may, 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 may help to kind of make it more, more grid-like. Then we want to uh, encode some uh, features. We have quite some, uh, what we call this, cycle, cyclical features, so things like date and time. And uh, we do this trick. It's maybe known in the ML community uh, by now. Basically, we're doing uh, coordinate transformation and uh, treating, a, let's say, time as, a, as being in polar coordinates, and we're transforming into Cartesian coordinates. And uh, well, this allows us to basically tell the ML model that, yeah, uh, the 12 o'clock is close to 11 o'clock, but it's also close to, to 1 o'clock, which is not quite uh, the same when you do, let's say, one hot encoding and label encoding. And yeah, we can visualize this and, and, and convince ourselves that, uh, yeah, that what we're doing makes sense. And finally, we have uh, just one <laughs> classical numerical feature that uh, we're just going to do standard scaling. And at the end, uh, we've uh, We've, uh, we've done a bunch of feature engineering. We've pre-processed some of them. And uh, let's, uh, let's visualize them. Let's uh, basically print, print them out and see what we've, what we've done. So we have a couple of PCA features, uh, the standard scale, the um, arc distance, and then the, the cyclical features uh, all, all here. And you can see VEX automatically adds uh, nice uh, nice names, but in the parameters of all the methods, you have options to basically customize, customize the names if you, if, you have, uh, if, if you have a wish to do so. So as we maybe discussed earlier, the target of this, uh, of this exercise is to predict, predict the trip duration. And uh, this is going to be my target. And we're going to do this in real time. I hope it's going to, to work. So I'm going to spend some time. This is going to take maybe a couple of minutes to, to finish. I'm going to spend some time explaining maybe one of the main reasons why VEXML exists. So what we do here is we're using scikit-learn's SGD regressor. It's a linear regression model, but uh, a regression model that supports incremental learning. And that means that we can pass a chunk of data at a time and the regressor will learn, and then we can pass another chunk, and the regressor will learn. And uh, in fact, the XML supports uh, wrappers or interfaces to a bunch of uh, popular machine learning libraries. So things like scikit-learn, XGBoost, LightGBM, to some degree Keras, and also River. But we don't do any re-implementation. It's just uh, we're passing on, on data. So if you're using, for example, classical scikit-learn models or XGBoost, the data that you want to pass on those models will be put into memory. But if, um, if a model supports partial fit, which means um, fit, fitting or training on, on, on some amount of data and then training on another part of the data, we can use this wrapper called incremental predictor. And in the background, VEX will stream over the data in chunks. So we're using quite big chunks now because we're just using simple numerical features. We'll pass it on the model. Once the model is le uh, finished learning, it will pass the next, uh, the next uh, in this case, 11 million uh, rows and so on. And we have the standard kind of options. Do we want to go over data once? Uh, do we want to shuffle the, the data of each batch or not? And we, of course, specify the, the target and feature. And uh, you may wonder, OK, this is fine, but this is convenience. But I can also <laughs> write my own for loop and maybe include Bunch of uh, bunch of other features, maybe more advanced shuffling or or something else. And the reason like why VEX is very convenient for this kind of operations is that everything in VEX is an expression, and on top of that, everything in VEX ML is a transformer. So you may think if you come from scikit-learn, usually transformers are things like standard scalars, categorical encoders, and so on. But in VEX, uh, the models, like the actual predictors or estimators, are also treated as transformers. And this is because, as we'll see in a minute, I just really want to show that you can, I mean, this is a simple model, and it's questionable whether it's like the ultimate best choice to do for this data set. But I, I just want to show that with VEX, choosing the right model, you can, in a very short amount of time, train a model on a billion rows in real time uh, on a kind of regular off-the-shelf uh, computer that, uh, that like most people 
probably have in their homes or in their offices. So the idea that everything is an expression uh, in the modeling comes that when we when we do uh, like a normal normal job with scikit-learn or XGBoost or your favorite model, when we do let's say model dot predict, we get an in-memory array or data frame or series with the with the well with the predictions. With VEX, the predict function is treated as an expression, so it's lazily evaluated. So that allows us to basically treat it as just another column in the data frame. And this gives us a bunch of options. We can do, we can have multiple models and then stack them or average them or do all kinds of diagnostics, error analysis, post-processing, and so on. So yeah, it takes about four minutes to train this model. Again, it's a simple linear model, but we have a lot of data, so maybe it's maybe it learned something. And now we can do. We have this uh, max uh, model uh, object. We can do transform. Again, uh, take it, take the VEX data frame, and we see the trip duration. This is the well. This is the test set. So we're looking at the actual y or the, the the known values, and this is the predicted values. And they're just another column in a data frame. And um, because this is using scikit-learn, so evaluating everything for a billion rows may be slow. But uh, trust me when I say that some like this model is not perfect. Some 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 numbers will be some prediction durations will be negative, and some will be unreasonably high. So we want to like, constrain this. Well, let's post process this and uh, let's say clip clip the final predictions to, to to a more reasonable range, and we get get another column that is let's say our final prediction. So in this case, it's uh, it's unchanged, but we've done some post processing on this. Uh, on this uh, on this uh, direct prediction from the model, and again treating it as just yet another column and um, into the data frame. And you may be wondering at this point, yeah, this is so cool, but you didn't build the pipeline. This is all like on the test on the training set. Uh, what are you going to do for the for the for the for the test set? Are we going to rewrite everything? And uh, Going back to like the original meme and Martin slides that everything in VES is an expression and everything that we did so far in this notebook is stored in this state. And you can actually view this state and it's basically a dictionary. It has all the columns we defined here, the, all the post-processing, you see the PCA, it's a dot product of basically the, 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 numerical, the numerical formula. All the way, if I scroll down, to the serialized model with scikit-learn that we built, and the post-processing, uh, the post-processing, uh, post-processing function. Actually, maybe I can show this quickly. It's a bit ugly at this moment; it has not gotten much love. But we have a way of visualizing. So, in the background, VEX does kind of like a computational graph, and you can see if I go to the top, we see how the columns all depend on each other. So we have the final prediction, and then depends on this clipping on this clipping function that's done on the predicted column. And this depends on this incremental function, basically the scikit-learn model. And this depends on all the features that, that we built into it and so on. So actually all we need to do is to take this state and apply it to any other data frame that has the same schema as this, as this, uh, as this df.train data frame. And we will basically get the entire pipeline applied to the new data frame. And there's a little subtle here. I'm not going to explain too much about it, but if you, if you, if you care or if you catch it, uh, then please ask a question. Because we are filtering things. Let me run this. Uh, we are filtering things. Like uh, we, we said, OK, we don't want uh, values going beyond certain ranges and so on. When we do apply this uh, state to the new data frame, let's say to the test data frame, certain values may be filtered out. So then uh, you may think, oh, I had some queries, but then uh, they disappeared. Why did they disappear? So we do a bit of a trick. So we add a variable to the known filter. And, and we had a variable called, let's say, production, and we keep it to test. And you keep it, we, we set it to false. And we add an additional filter on top of all the other filters we've already done in the process. And we have the logical operation or. So if this is false, it, 
basically nothing happens, but if it's true, it will basically disable or all the other filters because all the, for all the other filters, the logical operation is n. And finally, we want to basically save the state. We, we can save it uh, to our local system or we also support uh, saving it to the cloud. So I'm just gonna save it to, I have a GCP bucket, so I'm gonna save it to GCP storage. Finally, when we go to quote unquote production, I'm gonna switch to my final notebook and uh, oh, import VEX. Very simple, not many dependencies. I'm gonna import the exact same file. I'm gonna do the train test split, but now we're only gonna focus on this uh, test data frame. Let's look at it. It's, it has all the normal columns, nothing is done, none to in it's pristine. And now we're gonna load the, the state that we just saved to Google Drive. And when we preview this uh, test uh, data frame now, we see that we have all the columns and all of the operations that we did. So here are the PCA operations, uh, sorry, columns, the encodings, all the way to the predictions and the final predictions that we care about. So we can check metrics. We also have a nice uh, module that basically does the usual metrics uh, in a kind of parallelized way because we assume that people are gonna use relatively big data sets, big, big data sets with this, uh, with this, for, with this uh, library. And um, yeah, this, uh, well, this is also relying a bit on scikit-learn, but it's, I think Martin can correct me if I'm wrong here, but it's kind of equivalent of using apply in parallel. And yeah, this is the, well, the performance of our model on our unseen test set. It's maybe not perfect, but just to illustrate that, that we can do something that's somewhat meaningful. And uh, here is the final trick that I just mentioned. So the, the original, uh, data frame in a test set has this many, this many rows. When we apply the state, uh, because of the filter filters, we will filter out some columns, so basically we lose predictions. But now, if we load it again and set this variable to true, we see that uh, well, we get the original number of rows, so nothing is filtered out. However, you need to be a bit careful in case, uh, well, we filter things out for a reason. So if there's things like non, not a number uh, values or maybe extreme cases, maybe your model, well, the scikit-learn model or, or whatever model may not be basically fully compatible with that. So well, you just need to take, take, that, take that into account. So that's more or less uh, the story behind VIX. I mean, there are many more features and options, but this is kind of what excites maybe me the most. And yeah, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Otherwise, uh, I think Martin has a few more things to show you guys. What you got for us? You want to you share your okay. screen again? Ah, it's not chat. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry. I turned it off. Give me one second. Yeah, you should see it now. Yeah, okay. Nothing crashed. Good. Um, so yeah, so uh, thanks, uh, Johan, for this uh, basically demonstration of, of uh, uh, using facts in a, like an interactive way in a notebook. So uh, I, I want to get back a bit to um, uh, like facts in, uh, in production. So this is nice, but I need to put it in production maybe because you need to make a dashboard where you're feeding in uh, uh, the data from facts or some web API, you need to deploy an ML uh, model. And I think in all of these cases, FEX is uh, ideal, uh, especially in uh, dashboard, I'll show you an example of that. All the processes are sharing the, uh, the, the same uh, data. It's something that we didn't discuss, but um, especially in, in, in um, uh, where you see situations where you hit the same queries like dashboard, maybe the initial page load or, um, 
is that uh, uh, that always the same queries get uh, gets executed. So uh, we have a, a powerful caching system in uh, uh, Fax that can uh, can help there. Um, it's well tested with uh, Flask, so it also works well with uh, um, Dash and uh, Fast API. So if you're using that in the backend, that uh, that works uh, that works well. That's battle tested. Um, cloud storage support that you've seen, like uh, we have S3 and uh, Google Cloud Storage support using PyArrow and uh, FS Spec. So if there's anything like uh, Azure via FS Spec is also uh, for, is supported. Um, and we have a, a fax is actually a, like a kind of a, like a meta package that will give you the whole kitchen sink. But uh, especially if you want to like make small Docker containers or something, you can uh, just install like sub packages uh, to get like less dependencies in. So fax cores, basically all the core computational stuff. Uh, Jovan showed faxml for the ML parts, but there are many more uh, libraries that you can uh, can uh, that you get. All in one if you install fax, or if you want to be picky, you uh, basically pick what you uh, what you need. So just as an example, uh, let me let me show you this. It's a dashboard that we built uh, uh, using uh, Dash, and uh, yeah, um, and that's a, uh, this is a, a, a written in Dash uh, using uh, fax in the backend. And here we uh, we are visualizing 120 million uh, taxi trips. So this is, I think, only uh, uh, one year. And the uh, idea is that is uh, it's just one year, so multiple people can uh, can uh, uh, work on this. So if you scroll down, there's a GitHub repo. If you go here, uh, it will show you like all the code is here, some benchmarks on how many people will be able to uh, to use this. This is fully interactive. So if I, for instance, I click here, then all of these plots will show you like where people went. So if I click on JFK Airport, it will show you where people went. So they went to Manhattan and which uh, boroughs they uh, they went to. So everything here is interactive. You can select the pickup hours, day of week, etc., and everything gets recomputed. And it's pretty, uh, as you can see, it's pretty. Uh, Past. We also have a, uh, a trip planner. So again, showing this heat map, so you can zoom in and it will recompute. And say you want to go from this spot to this spot, it will show you how much you paid, trip duration, and again you can do the all the filtering just to show you that it that you can uh, build a uh, dashboard using uh, using fax. Um, so who's using uh, FX? So well, as Ben said in the introduction, Galileo is using it. Um, uh, Plotly is using it um, now as a uh, um, default backend for large data sets for the new product, uh, Plotly Dashboard Engine. Uh, so basically all the clients get access to big data without any setup. So that simplifies infrastructure a lot, as you can imagine. Um, we had a project with Biascribe where we uh, uh, they had an uh, interactive like, exploration of genomics uh, data, and we, we had a decent uh, performance increase uh, there. And um, close to our roots, astronomy, uh, working with uh, Space uh, Telescope Science Institute for, uh, for doing uh, uh, remote interactive exploration, where you basically don't download the data, but you execute the queries remote. So we actually, uh, we didn't discuss this, but we have this remote data frame API as, uh, as well. So uh, okay, this is all nice. It's open source. Like, uh, how do you uh, how do you feed your family? Um, so we started company Fexio is basically uh, consult mostly consultancy, but we also do uh, fe uh, feature development. So if there's something like you you can use Fex, but it's missing this feature or it's not fast enough, you can uh, contact us and we uh, uh, we can develop this. We also do support or retainers to get us uh, on speed dial, uh, help with performance. Uh, maybe train you on how to uh, uh, get the optimal performance and uh, the, the money uh, um, that we uh, get from that also flows back to the open source uh, uh, maintenance. So yeah, just a final slide. Uh, if you want to contact us, uh, this is a GitHub link. We're also active on Twitter. Documentation, examples can be found here. And uh, I guess Jovan will put the... Uh, um, the um, uh, link to the uh, this, these slides and the um, 
uh, the notebooks on this uh, this repo. That's it. Yeah, I'll, I'll add it uh, right after right after this talk. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you guys so much for for taking the time and for showing us all of the really cool things in VIX. You have something that you went through really quickly, but I, I think is cooler than you give it credit for is that in the get column names, when you're actually selecting columns, you can use regex to select <laughs> any regex of all of your columns to so anything underscore X. I've used that. We have that in our code, which is very, very helpful as well. Yeah, thanks. That was actually a contribution, but it was a very, very nice one. I like it as well. Because sometimes you end up with funky names and you just want those and columns get to multiply quite quickly when you do exploration. So it's, it's quite useful, I agree. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, cool. If there are any other questions, drop them. Feel free to drop them in the chat. Um, otherwise, I think we're up on time. I think this was perfectly timed. Thanks, uh, Ben. Thanks for inviting us and giving us the opportunity to, uh, to show this work. Thank you.